Um, welcome to easily the best session of this entire conference. Um, uh, I'll explain uh, the, the rule of um, play such as it is um, quickly. Uh, my name is Stephen Dubner. I am um, flattered and grateful uh, and deeply unqualified to be leading this session. Um, but um, uh, the session, as I'm, I'm sure you, you know, is called Behavioral Experiments on Online Platforms, Insights and Implications, which seems to be fairly self-explanatory, so I won't go on about that. We have an excellent panel, not excellent just for um, quality and, and content, but for um, diversity to some degree. Um, and I think it will be a great conversation for um, all stakeholders. I represent that this conference represents a particular um, kind of stakeholder, but if you think about the world generally with private firms and institutions including governments and their regulatory role and then actual citizenry, um, and I find that one thing that often gets overlooked is that the citizenry is much larger than these other classes, but these other classes, you, um, because you're at the center of things and have leverage to make decisions, we often forget how large the citizenry is. And so I think it'll be a really interesting opportunity to engage, um, to, to look at things from the inside out and from the outside in. Um, so our, our names are there. Oh, I, I do Freakonomics Radio. That's um, uh, my um, business. And so I have conversations with people like these um, in, a, in a much uh, less exciting setting usually. And so the format shall be introduction of our three wonderful speakers. They will each make an opening statement. Then we will have a vigorous discussion. And then there will be questions from the audience. Everybody knows how to submit their questions. Is that true? Um, clap twice if you know how to submit questions. Great, fantastic. So we'll have about 10 or 15 minutes of that at the end. So we will begin. Um, there's no other business, is there, Chris? That's the end of the business? Okay, great. We'll begin then with introductions. First, uh, to my immediate right, is uh, someone I'm sure many of you know, Elizabeth Costa, who is with uh, Senior Director at the Behavioral Insights team, uh, where she leads a portfolio of teams working on areas including consumer markets, financial decision-making, and economic growth, so easy stuff. For example, she has recently partnered with Fintechs to design and test product features to help people save and to repay credit. She's led a series of lab experiments investigating how to improve consumers' understanding of online contractual terms and privacy notices. Um, and she's working on a field experiment with an online job board to encourage employers to advertise jobs with flexible working options, which sounds very worthwhile. Elizabeth recently co-wrote a discussion paper with David Halpern, BIT chief executive, which explored the characteristics of, on, of the online environment from a behavioral science perspective, such as the delivery deliberate design, ability to generate enormous quantities of data, and how we behave, combined with the potential for mass experimentation. Elizabeth holds an LLM from Harvard Law School, where she focused on regulatory theory. Would you please welcome Elizabeth Costa? Our next esteemed panelist is Curtis Cobb in the center of the three. Curtis is a director of research of Facebook and leads demography and... Sur By the way, if I say anything that's wrong, please jump in, okay? Because I'd rather not have a wrongness all read right, into the record. Was yours all right? All right, yeah. thank Notice you. Notice I only did it after it was done. Yeah. <laughs> thank uh, you. So Curtis Cobb is a director of research at Facebook and leads demography and survey science, a methods-focused quantitative social science team that specializes in the design and implementation of rigorous measurement and research to address large-scale, complex problems that span across products and product groups. His team's work often includes both on- and off-platform experiments and causal inference with survey-based outcomes. Curtis has more than 15 years of experience in social research. Prior to Facebook, he was Senior Director of Survey Methodology at GFK, which is a market... market research firm. Market German. research firm based in Germany. You were working in the States or in yes. Germany? Okay. Uh, he consulted on studies for clients, including the Associated Press, CBS News, Yahoo, Pew Research Center, CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, yes, uh, the U.S. State Department, and, the new, and numerous academic institutions. He holds a Ph.D. I said that like a, a game show, like a dating um, game. He holds a Ph.D. <laughs> in sociology from Stanford University. Please welcome Curtis Cobb. And finally, our, 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 our last um, contestant, uh, 
<laughs> Moshe Katzwer from Uber. Moshe manages the Marketplace Experimentation Team at Uber. Marketplace Experimentation is a team of economists, statisticians, and engineers that solve the unique measurement and experimentation challenges that arise on Uber's real-time, dynamically equilibrating physical network. Before I finish, raise your hand if you've not taken an Uber in your life. Wow. What's your problem, you eight people? Um, I mean, it has been a remarkable um, story. Uh, no offense to, um, you know, also remarkable. Okay. So um, <laughs> before focusing on experimentation, Moshe worked on Uber's driver positioning team, algorithmically generating real-time relocation recommendation for Uber's drivers. Moshe holds a PhD in economics from Princeton, where he focused on industrial organization, computation, and game theory. So how about one quick uh, happy applause for all three of our... Um, thank you. Okay. So that's who they are. That's what they do. Now we will hear uh, first individually and then collectively their ideas, their, um, their projects, their concerns, and so on. So opening statement first, Moshe, please. And Moshe has some slides. Okay. Uh, first, I just want to start by thanking BIT for inviting me and for organizing this wonderful conference. It's been truly inspiring to just see such a huge concentration of people kind of in one place who are just constantly thinking about how to improve the world through better science and better policy. It's really humbling. Um, so today, I'm going to talk about experimentation at Uber. Um, but I'm going to start with kind of a simple thought experiment. So suppose that there's a large tech company that wants to experiment, that wants to launch a product, OK? But instead of having millions or billions of users, this tech company only has about 1,000 users, maybe a few hundred users. Further, suppose that of those roughly 1,000 users, about 30 generate most of the activity on the platform. And now further suppose that of those 30 users who are most relevant, they all have very different activity, usage, click patterns over the course of a week, over the course of a year. So in a world like this, where n is so small, how do we experiment? How do we innovate? How do we test things at scale? So unsurprisingly, this company is Uber. You probably didn't expect anything else. Um, and the specific problem that I'm going to talk about was the launch of a new product, Express Pool. I'm pretty sure it's called that in London, but I'm not sure. Express Pool is the rideshare carpooling product where you have to walk a little bit from your pickup spot and to your destination. And so because of the implicit network effects and economies of scale in a product like Express Pool, it's something where our fundamental unit of observation has to be at the city level. It's not something that we can kind of give to you and you, but not you, and test its efficacy. We kind of need to roll it out or not roll it out. So stepping back, I manage MX, which is the marketplace experimentation team. I'm an economist by training. Um, and almost all large Uber initiatives have kind of gone through our platform for the final verdict on what their impact was. And that includes things like surge pricing, which I'm sure everyone in this room loves, uh, our matching algorithms, our loyalty programs, rolling out new user apps, and the launch of Express Pool, which is what I'm going to talk about here. So just quickly, I want to kind of briefly touch on why experimenting at Uber is particularly difficult. Um, each tech company kind of has specific curiosities or peculiarities about what their product is that can make experimentation hard for them. For Uber, it's network effects. So you can't really think of our riders and drivers as kind of like islands where I treat one and there's no ripple effects through the network, right? All of our riders and drivers and couriers and restaurants, they're all interacting on the same physical network. So just for example, suppose I lower the prices for you, you, and you. You might request more trips, fine. Maybe we can see that, maybe we can't. But by requesting more trips, you're going to raise ETAs and potentially raise surge in prices for the people who we didn't give the discount to, right? So that can exaggerate the effects of this like pricing intervention, which makes measurement hard. Similarly, we could think of a case where effects are attenuated. Suppose I give positioning recommendations to drivers, where half of the drivers in an area 
I tell them, consider driving over there for more trips and more money. They might do that. They might get more trips and more money by following those recommendations. But by moving them, we've left drivers in an area who are now facing less competition and will also see an increase in earning and an increase in trips. And that's an example of kind of where the effects are attenuated. Now, these are kind of like simple stories, but in a real-world experiment, a priori, it can be hard to even sign which direction we think the bias goes and what we measure in a user-level RCT. And so for most market-level things that we want to test, this rules out traditional user A-B testing. Um, and this isn't restricted just to the world of Uber. Like, kind of think about the policy settings that, we're, that, we, that people in this room work on. We could look at, like, an educational intervention where we raise test scores for this group. Okay, maybe we can measure that in an A-B experiment. And then we say, oh, but these increased educational attainments are tied to these incomes later in life. And it's like, wait, wait. The value of education, that's a general equilibrium quantity, right? You can't measure that in an RCT what kind of the general equilibrium effect of your intervention will be. Um, so just I'll quickly go through this. A case study was the launch of Express Pool. So like I said, this was a product where you need to walk to a destination and a pickup. And because we ask you to walk, we can create more efficient routes, um, and we can batch more riders together in the same car. And that allows us to lower prices and lead to overall shorter trip times. But this is a product that explicitly relies on economies of scale to work, right? I can't roll this out to 5% of people and think that I'm going to learn anything about how this would work with 100% rollout. So because of this, our only real measurement technique was to launch this citywide and see what would happen. And so our strategy was synthetic control. So I'm not going to go into specifically what synthetic control is, but it's a fancy difference in difference method. So we rolled this product out to six large US cities and compared it to cities where we didn't roll it out. We used those control cities to generate counterfactuals for what would have happened in our treatment cities had we not rolled the product out. And then comparing actual to counterfactual gave us our treatment effect. And in this example, we worked really hard to keep Uber quiet. So we didn't launch any products for months. We didn't do pricing changes. We didn't really change anything. And even in that world, it was super hard to measure. Um, but at the end, we kind of got results that lined up with what our offline simulations and what our back-of-the-envelope math predicted. So these approaches can work. They're just hard. Um, so I'll just quickly close with this, some of the challenges of experimentation at Uber. The number one challenge is power. Like I said, you could think of our N as like 30, not 15 million, which is the number of trips we do a day. N is like 30. We have like 30 big cities. We can't really stack experiments. Power is this conserved quantity, and we only have so much of it. Another challenge is that, as I said earlier, Uber is a real-world physical network, right? So this isn't just people kind of like looking at a screen and maybe we take their attention for an hour. This is how people commute. This is how drivers feed their families. This is how the disabled are able to have mobility. This is how underserved neighborhoods are able to actually commute into downtowns in areas without public transport. And that's something that we take super seriously at Uber and care a lot about in the products we design and the things we choose to test. Um, and kind of the last thing that's kind of an ongoing challenge is long term. If you kind of talk to any tech company, they'll tell you long term is really, really, really hard to measure. I was once talking to a colleague at Facebook, and I was saying, oh, we're really struggling with this long term stuff. And he was like, oh, we solved that. And I was like, you solved that? What does that mean? And he's like, no, no, we figured that out. I'm like, what does long term mean to you? And he's like, oh, six days, seven days? And it's like, no, 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 I want to know a year and a half. Um, so things I'm excited about at Uber, more economic modeling just because of the limits of experimentation, um, and making progress on the long run measurement problem. So I'll conclude with that. Thank you for listening. Um, if anyone here who hasn't taken an Uber, uh, come to me after. Let's talk. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mish. I, th I thought that was um, a, a very, um, very slick uh, slander of your um, Facebook, um, your, your new Facebook friend. Um, but I'm sure Curtis can can rally and rise. I just have to find out who that was. Okay. And <laughs> okay. Share with them all of our long-term experiments that are running. Um, 
<laughs> that are much longer than six days. Uh, I'm going to use the podium because I have notes and I don't want to show you my walking around looking at my notes, um, if that's all right. Uh, I won't start with a thought experiment, but if I were, I would say, imagine you have 2.7 billion users instead of 30. <laughs> um, <laughs> But, but that actually becomes important later on for, uh, for the points that I actually want to uh, make. Um, but let me first uh, start out by saying um, thank you for allowing me to be here and share with you today. Uh, I should note that I'm speaking for myself based upon the experience that I have working uh, as a researcher uh, over the last uh, 15-ish years. Uh, I'm not necessarily here speaking on behalf of Facebook. Um, and so I'm going to draw from multiple experiences, including the ones that I had at Facebook. I must also caveat that the team that I lead at Facebook of social scientists, our chief objective is not experimentation per se, um, but we do spend a great deal of time helping other teams develop the hypotheses uh, that they might want to experiment on, improve their experimental setups, and most importantly, uh, explain why they obtain the outcomes that they do after they run the experiments that they have. Um, and I've also worked with various other tech firms to set up similar teams that focus on those sorts of uh, research protocols and practices. If I had to step back, I'd say that we, uh, as researchers, are living in a wonderful time where the conditions are very right for us right now uh, to make great advances in our understanding of both human behavior and social processes. Um, and platforms, uh, particularly platforms like Uber or, or Facebook or others, um, are excellent microcosms of the broader social environment um, and it really allows us to study things that before were not uh, very easy and that sometimes um, nearly impossible. Uh, and so it's a great thing that the tech industry has established a culture of experimentation. Um, we obviously conduct lots of A-B tests uh, that routinely help us decide which products to launch or what decisions to make. A few examples that you might recognize from your experience at Facebook. Uh, does, who doesn't use a Facebook-owned product? Okay. Like, two of you over there. You don't have to talk to me later. It's... <laughs> we would love to have you, though. Um, uh, some of those are like optimizing the order of your newsfeed, making sure that we're surfacing to you the things that you actually are interested and uh, not uh, making you feel like you're, you're missing out on information that you otherwise should have access to. Um, which notifications to surface and what information should be in those notifications to make them most useful to a user uh, is also something that obviously we do a lot of testing on. Uh, even which nudges to build into our reporting tools uh, to encourage our users to identify and help us remove um, harmful content that might find its way onto the site. Um, all of that is done through experimentation. Um, and it, it's great that, the, that tech companies uh, have the ability to, to move quickly in those ways. Um, I would also say that some of my most uh, favorite experiments conducted at Facebook are done by our well-being team. Uh, I think the session just before this, there was uh, a session on uh, social media and well-being. Um, and I, I think that they're doing amazing things that wouldn't be possible uh, or very easy otherwise, such as uh, testing what it's like to hide uh, the number of counts that people receive for their likes, which you might have seen in the uh, media lately that we're doing so. Um, while this is very much a tactical experiment for Facebook uh, as a mission-driven company to try to understand uh, what uh, the like count is doing to our users, it also provides a greater understanding about the relationship between uh, general issue, issues of social comparison and subjective well-being uh, that can inform broader sets of knowledge than just what Facebook should do on the site. Um, now, layered across all of those examples uh, that makes Facebook really uh, powerful, and I think Uber as well, is the ability to understand network effects um, and, uh, and truly understand how impressive those are. But there's, 
there's some things that we have to work on, both as, uh, as tech and as a broader research community. The counterfactual framework that these platforms provide are useful tools for testing hypotheses and learning about the world, but they're only a tool. Importantly, there are many considerations and challenges that exist in the world where the cost of experimentation has been greatly reduced. And these are the things that I actually want us to think about uh, somewhat. They're not unique to the tech industry, but in my view, with the current environment, it makes them more apparent than what they were before. Um, there are technical and methodological challenges, such as sutva violations, especially interference. I think what uh, uh, you were just sharing about Uber is right uh, there in that respect. There's going from uh, what we might call state to pate, the sample average treatment effect to the population average treatment effect, and making sure that we have developed rigorous frameworks such that what we're learning in experimentation actually informs the populations that we're working on. Uh, there's something that we call truncation by death, which means when people fall out of your experiment and making sure that you appropriately account for that uh, when you're actually looking at trying to estimate your outcomes. Um, we on my team think a lot about these issues and how to deal with them. Um, and to me, it's exciting that we uh, have the experimental tools to be able to, uh, to make progress on those areas. Uh, but there are other things that I worry about that, um, that are not tool-based or, or methods-based. Um, so, for example, I actually worry that tech has become too reliant on experiments and places too much blind faith in the power of that methodology to solve all things. Um, and what I'm really concerned about is that the rest of social research, as the cost of experimentation decreases, uh, will follow suit. Um, an example of that are teams that chase very tiny effect sizes, um, where people believe that any statistically significant effect is a sign of progress or impact without really scrutinizing those effects and consider whether those effects are actually meaningful. You can imagine if you have 2.7 billion users that your experiments can be really large and you can find any effect size you want to find. Uh, any effect you want to find, not the effect size, sorry. Um, I, and this isn't just an issue in experimentation, it's an issue in big data as well, um, where uh, how easy it is to obtain data and run experiments uh, leads to facts, but doesn't lead to understanding. What we find ourselves in the situation as, is essentially having a tsunami of disparative facts. That, uh, that nobody has brought together into a cohesive synthesis. Um, and, and so what happens is that, that all of this work ends up not living up to the expectations that uh, were brought before it. Um, so what I worry about is tech uh, investing too much in finding effects and not enough in building knowledge. Um, there are important mechanisms that we can put in place to try to overcome this, and I think we should, uh, such as considering alternative hypotheses when we're formulating our experiments, uh, setting up crucial tests so that, our, so that we're not just finding effects, but we're actually uh, trying to determine between alternative effects, uh, looking for heterogeneous effects across various populations, identifying important counter metrics that help us determine if the results are, uh, are as they're operationalized, are uh, truly positive to what we want to obtain. Um, what these additional research steps all have in common is that they are best done when relying on theory. And that is what I'm afraid is slipping away, is sort of our reliance on theory as researchers. Um, these often are not just simple problems of optimization. Uh, and due diligence requires uh, that we start before the experiment uh, begins collecting data, actually thinking through all of these steps, um, and afterwards thinking through the implications. Um, what I'd say is that we're doing, uh, what I'd say is that many of the hard decisions that we talk about when we think about experimentation are really made outside of the experimentation framework. What should the outcome of interest be? What is a meaningful effect size? How do we balance competing signals? What are the mechanisms at work behind the effects we're measuring? Um, and it's also within these types of decisions that we grapple with the, uh, many of the ethical challenges 
uh, that uh, arise uh, when thinking about research. Um, and I'm not sure actually right now, even though we're tech people, that tech has insights about how to grapple with those issues. Um, I think it's something uh, that will be important that we think about increasing the training of data scientists in all of those ways, not just in the statistics or, or the experimentation but process, but also how to think about theory, how to think about meaningfulness and those sorts of things and the results that they uh, come through. And I helped do this training at Facebook, but the idea is that people are actually coming in out of schools without that exposure, going into, uh, into jobs where they are, are starting to work in experimentation, and, and really they're missing some of those important components. Um, the other thing is uh, really collaboration. An important problem for tech is that we can, uh, that can easily arise is that we can only measure the outcomes we can think of and not necessarily the outcomes that other people think we should be measuring. Um, we have our own blindnesses uh, about us. Um, and I'm not aware of a good institutionalized process where groups that are not internal to tech companies can get involved and help identify the concerns, uh, help identify the outcomes, help identify the experimental designs that we should be uh, leveraging as we have these powerful platforms to do so. Um, and that is one of the things that, uh, that I think poli the policy world, uh, the, uh, the academy, tech and everyone else needs to get together and come up with a framework for how uh, we can actually share in the process, um, both at the design stage, but also at the distribution of knowledge stage. Um, and then uh, I'll just end by saying one of the things that has been powerful at Facebook with respect uh, to my group that I really enjoy with uh, with the experimentation work that we do that I think is also important to think about incentivizing within uh, experimentation platforms on tech is that for my group, we are not held to moving the company's bottom line. We can be completely agnostic to the outcome of any of the experiments that we're involved in. Nobody is expecting us to, to cheer for one side uh, in any way, and as a matter of fact, what they try to get us to do is figure out all the problems that happen within an experimental setting. Um, and so what that does is that actually really frees us up so that uh, we're thinking more holistically about the process. And I think that we need to figure out ways to implement more of that within tech as well. As I said, we live in wonderful times right now. The conditions are right for us to make great advances. Uh, but we still have a ways to go in refining the processes and the institutions that we have to get there. That's it. Thank you, Curtis. Um, I'm sure we all appreciate that interestingly, confessionally existential view of your own work, which <laughs> I think is uh, right for discussion. So thank you very much. Liz Costa, please. Great, oh. thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Liz Costa from the Behavioral Insights team. Um, at BIT, I lead our work on economic policy and recently I've been thinking a lot about how people behave online and make decisions online and particularly what that means for how we should be thinking about regulating digital markets and online platforms. And today I, I want you to take away four key points from, from these opening remarks. So the first is that the design of online platforms is hugely consequential for the choices that people make online uh, and their behavior online. And secondly, that means that when platforms are designed poorly, whether that's intentional or unintentional, it can lead to some pretty terrible outcomes for individuals, for communities, for democracies. Uh, but thirdly, there is huge potential to design platforms in a way that encourages consumers, uh, in particular, to make better choices for themselves. And I'm going to talk through some examples of that today. 
And the fourth key point, uh, which is what we're all here to talk about today, is that experimentation is really key to better understanding the mechanisms at play um, of how people behave online and how people make decisions online. And as Curtis has just pointed out, I think we need some better mechanisms to share those insights that are flowing from experimentation on, on private platforms and think about how we build those insights together. So taking a step back, um, the reason that we got interested in this area in particular. So over the past decades, it's, it's clear that the internet has transformed how we live, how we work, how we interact with each other. Um, and overall, it's been an incredible force for good and has brought huge benefits to consumers, to economies worldwide. But we, we're also seeing a shift starting to occur. You know, there has been enormous public trust put in online platforms and companies, and some of that is starting to erode. Um, and in particular, people are starting to become concerned about issues like algorithmic bias, like disinformation, uh, the impact of social media on people's productivity um, on our mental health. And really, governments worldwide, I think with the UK leading the way, um, are starting to sharpen it, their focus on these issues and think about actually what is the role for governments in this space um, and, and how can they best exercise um, their, their powers, um, particularly looking at that spectrum of what's been called online harms um, that flow to individuals and communities. And really, the reason that BIT got interested in this space is that, in our view, many of those failures and distortions in online markets are behavioural in nature, whether it's because consumers are inattentive to online privacy notices um, or whether it's because we've, we have this erosion of civility in online platforms, which is changing the character in which we interact with each other and the tone of our public discourse. These are inherently behavioural issues, um, but there's also potentially behavioural solutions and tools to correct for these, for these issues. And particularly, we think that um, large-scale experimentation and behavioural tools can be deployed to improve the way that consumers make decisions online um, and raise the tone of the way that we interact with each other online. So I'm going to talk through a few examples of experiments that we've run with online platforms and also in online lab experiments where we're simulating the environments of online platforms to see how people make choices in these environments. And as I said, what we see is that in the same way that our behaviour is, um, is sensitive to subtle environmental cues in the offline environment, we also see this online. And in fact, it's, it's in, in many ways sharpened and exacerbated online. So I'm going to start by, by talking about um, examples where poor design can lead to poor outcomes. And this first one I've got up here is both sides of the coin. It's both poor example and potential for good. Um, so, so put your hands up if you've ever read the full terms and conditions of any of the online platforms you interact with. It's going to be the eight people who yes. never... Yes, <laughs> we have <laughs> one person. Excellent. So <laughs> this is a, a classic issue of, um, of information overload and inattention. Uh, very few people read the terms of engagement online. Uh, so we don't know the terms on which we're interacting um, with online platforms. We don't truly understand how our data is being used. Um, and I think that's problematic, even if it's being used for, for good and, uh, and worthwhile purposes. I think it's important for consumers to understand the true value exchange that, that's happening there. And we've run a series of online experiments looking at how we can boost consumers' engagement and comprehension of online contractual terms and privacy notices. And the good news is that, in fact, there are behavioural techniques that can really improve people's engagement and understanding. So as you can see here, um, telling people how long it takes to read a privacy notice um, more than doubles people, the rate at which people are clicking on them. I should say that the baselines here are relatively low. Um, 
So, and, and displaying terms and conditions as frequently asked questions or, or summaries of key terms also significantly increases people's understanding of them. But as I said, we're, we're working off a really low base here, and I think we need a more fundamental rethink about how we're communicating with consumers about really the, the terms on which they're engaging online. Another example um, which Richard Thaler talks about a lot is called sludge. Um, so this is where behavioural techniques are used not to encourage people to make better choices for themselves, but actually to encourage people to not take action that might be in their best interests. Um, and a great example is online subscription traps. So it's very, very easy to sign up for an online subscription, whether that's to a news website um, or even a gym membership, whatever it might be. Um, but it's extremely hard to unsubscribe, and you will find yourself uh, caught in a loop of online and offline frictions, and many of you will give up. Um, and it, most of the time, that is intentional on the part of the platform. It's there to, to keep you subscribed and keep you there, even if you've decided that that's not what you want to do anymore. And this can also have deeper effects, these ideas of... Um, of how platforms are designed. So Professor Mike Luca, who's actually speaking in another room right now, has done some really interesting experiments with Airbnb, uh, where he's found that uh, the design of the platform, where uh, if you're receiving requests from a guest, you see both their name and a photo of them, um, which seems like a, you know, a great way to build a community and have transparency in that community. Um, but what he actually finds is that guests with distinctly African-American names are 16% less likely to be accepted for an Airbnb than people with similar uh, classically white-sounding names. And this has been run as well looking at discrimination against implied same-sex couples in Ireland. Uh, and really this is about the design of the platform, which I think in this case is unintentionally having a dis discriminatory outcome and something for us to be really cognizant of that these subtle design features do have these large impacts on people's choices and decisions. But really, I'm also here to say that, that choice architecture and behavioral science can be harnessed to help people make better choices online and that there's a huge amount of potential here. Um, so often online environments, they tend to encourage us to more fluidly express our first order preferences, our impulsive preferences. And there's a lot of things that can be done to encourage consumers to stop and reflect and think about whether that's really the action that they want to take. Uh, and a great example is the work that Monzo's been doing. Monzo's a challenger bank here in the UK. Um, they found that many of their customers, uh, well, sorry, not many, but a, a a sizable minority of their customers um, were looking for tools to help them control how much they were spending on gambling. And so what Monzo did was introduce this gambling block where people could sign up uh, to block all gambling transactions within the banking app. Um, and if they wanted to remove this block, they were, they were open and free to do that, but there was an amount of friction in place there. So it took 48 hours for the block to be lifted once somebody had called the Monzo customer service line and said they wanted that to happen. And I think that there's potential for this type of tool to be used across lots of different platforms to encourage people to set their preferences for how they want to interact, how much time they want to spend, what they want to spend their money on, and have these tools which still preserve their freedom of choice but also guide them in a more deliberate way towards the types of actions that they'd like to be taking. And choice architecture on platforms can also be used to achieve policy goals that are beneficial to both the platform and the users. So this is an example um, of an experiment that we ran recently, uh, which you would have seen in David Halpin's opening talk as well, and, uh, and in the unconscious bias session if you just went to it. Um, so this is a, an RCT that we ran with an online job board here in the UK. Uh, what we see across the labour market in the UK is that 
90% of job seekers say that they prefer flexibility uh, in, their, in their employment, but only 10% of jobs are actually advertised as flexible. So employers are, um, I guess, undervaluing how much consumers and, and uh, job seekers want to see these flexible options. And so we tested changing the choice architecture of the platform itself to give prompts to employers who were listing jobs on the job site to encourage them to think about whether these jobs could be done flexibly and whether they could advertise those jobs as flexible. Um, so this is the prompt that people saw saying, which flexible working options would you consider? And you can see only one of these nine options is that there is no flexibility uh, that can be offered. And what we see is that it both has a significant impact on the number of jobs that are being advertised as flexible by employers, a 20% increase, and it also boosts the average number of applicants per job. Um, so it has an amazing impact across the market and is a great example of how a small change in the design and choice architecture of a platform can create excellent outcomes for individuals, for the labor market, and for the platform itself. So really across all of these areas, you can see that experimentation is a route to better understanding the behavioral mechanisms at play on online platforms and understanding what types of solutions uh, might encourage consumers to make better choices uh, and in a way that also works for platforms. And we've seen some great examples from Uber and from Facebook and also from Steph Stevens davidowitz yesterday on how we can build these, uh, this uh, body of experimentation. And I think we, we face a few different challenges which I'm key, keen to discuss today. The first is that we need a better evidence base about the causal relationship between screen time, whether it's on particular platforms or in general, um, and different types of welfare effects, how it affects our productivity, how it affects the decisions we're making on those platforms and in other parts of our lives. And one of the challenges we face there is that a lot of the data is currently generated and held by private companies. Um, and I've been struck during the conference that many of the presenters are really keen to test new interventions, uh, but they need access to people, they need access to scale, uh, and they need to test interventions in real decision-making environments. So we saw in the disinformation session people were very keen to, to test ways to inoculate people against fake news on Facebook, on, on other online platforms. And I'm keen to talk about how we can uh, share those insights together. And I'm all, I also think we should touch on the ideas that, uh, you know, Facebook has 2.7 billion users. You have an enormous reach and impact on people's lives. And it would be great to talk about how you think about what the limits of your experimentation should be and whether you are best placed to decide that or what kind of regulatory um, guidance you'd like to, to help you make those decisions. So with that, I think we should dive in. But thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I think that was um, uh, a, a direct enough question, um, <laughs> whether, whether you are um, the right person to make those decisions. But rather than get into the specifics quickly, um, what I want to say is uh, we'll, we'll chat here for a bit. Then the, the questions from you that have been coming in are excellent. So I want to um, get to those, um, leave plenty of time for those. Let's start with a very um, brief question for each of you to answer, literally like a, a lightning round one, where I just want a really quick answer. And if you don't have an answer to this question, it's okay. Um, um, tell me something that you believed for a long time to be true in your work. Tell me something about your work that you believed for a long time to be true uh, until you found out that you were wrong. Or, you know, if you don't like the wrong formulation, something that you fundamentally changed your mind about by seeing data that um, you know, persuaded you otherwise. Um, and again, if we could, just a sentence or two, because I'm curious for the examples. Uh, sure. So all throughout grad school, I saw hundreds and hundreds of difference and difference papers. And I was like, yeah, those are reasonable. OK. It wasn't until getting to Uber and seeing just the vast amount of time series data that Uber has at its fingertips that I kind of realized how bogus most of those difference and difference papers are. 
and how bogus most instrumental variables papers are. <laughs> uh, I, trust, I trust all empirical work much less than joining a bird. Wow, okay, good. I, I, probably the same, but I, I think one of the findings that uh, was internally held at Facebook for a long time is, was a belief, and it was a Western notion, that, uh, that people did not want to connect to people they didn't know in real life. Um, and, uh, and as we started doing more work in the developing world, that was all people from the developing world wanted to connect with. They had the people in real life close to them already. It's not like they had ties all over the place, uh, like uh, more mobile po uh, populations might. So they actually wanted to experience the outside world from their city, town, village, whatever, uh, through a platform like Facebook. And it led to a, a reconciling where we had to t think about wh what do we think Facebook should be? Should it be a place for people to connect to mm -hmm. only people they know in real life, which is what we originally tried to set it up for? Or how do we adjust to uh, address this emergent use case that actually for a fully networked system, mm. some people wouldn't enjoy. Right, that's really interesting. Although that's an arrow that's only traveling in certain directions, one assumes, yes? I mean, like LinkedIn, if you have 100,000 people, true. you're not connecting with the people who have four, they're connecting with you. So it becomes yeah. a utility question, which is fascinating. Liz, yeah? Um, we ran an experiment a couple of years ago where I, our hypothesis was that if we encouraged line managers in the police force to put themselves in the position of a pregnant colleague, um, that it would help them take their perspective, um, understand the challenges uh, of being in that situation, and would ultimately lead to more supportive, less discriminatory line managers. It and did in not, fact, did it? it didn't, yeah. no, it backfired. Yeah. So, yeah. good example of where the... The theory and the hypothesis was sound, but actually, uh, when that uh, when we tested that in the real world, it in fact did not work. Um, I, I've always wondered whether the whole notion of perspective taking—I mean, it's such a lovely notion—and I know PhD psychologists can sell it really well, but I've never bought it. I mean, I want <laughs> to buy it, but okay, maybe that's just my shortcoming. Okay, so let me propose. Um, uh, a formula, sort of, that, the way I see it. And I'm probably totally wrong. But, um, you know, last night we did a panel where we had a number of um, uh, practitioners um, that usually we don't hear about so much with nudge theory. We had um, firefighting represented, policing, and, and healthcare. And it was really interesting because it's a lot of real world stuff. And, um, and hearing you two talk about your platforms and then Liz talk about hers. Um, and, and I want to be careful not to conflate. Uber and Facebook are very, 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 very different firms, very different platforms. And I think when you know, a lot of people talk about tech, they conflate all these platforms, which is ridiculous because they serve, they're different companies with different cultures, they serve dis different constituencies and so on. But it strikes me that a lot of tech platforms um, create massive consumer value, um, often massive consumer surplus, um, uh, but let's not forget that the main role is profit maximizing, okay? That's, that's what firms are for. So you've got the profit maximizing as a, let's call it a pure motive over here. Then you've got consumer value and even consumer surplus as a, as a, as a product. And then as a byproduct sometimes is a, a negative, let's say, amount of social decency, what you might call it, right? Where the public feels that firms that do things for their own good, that create a lot of good for themselves, for the consumers, they destroy some value for consumers in different ways. So anybody who's read a little bit of journalism knows that Facebook and Uber and, and many other firms, you know, that's, that's the way it works. You hear, we hear about these things, we assume they're fairly anomalous. Um, but it strikes me a little bit like, uh, to be very nasty to you guys for just a minute, and I'm just kidding, you know, it'd be like as if last night we were talking about firefighting. You're the firefighter, and you guys are the arsonists, okay? So um, there's this wonderful thing going on which creates value, but also fires that need to be put out. And so, Liz, it strikes me that a lot of what you're talking about are basically addressing the difficulties that are created by the bounty of the tech platforms. So what I really want to do is use the opportunity to have the three of you here together to say what in your platforms you think you're not doing well relate, in, in relation to what regulators and or policymakers and or policy advisors see it, and what you think you're not doing well, because I think the public does feel a little bit left out. Um, I think the public feels as though 
whatever. I think we know what the, what the public feels about, but I really want to know what you each feel you could do better from your perspective to satisfy, to make Liz's next slideshow feel like um, things are moving in a direction that provides more social benefit across the board. And you, similarly, what you guys feel comes from could come from the policy side that these firms are doing brilliantly that governments and regulators are often not doing so well. So in, in, in any order that you'd like. <laughs> Shall I start? <laughs> sure. So I think there's, there's a huge amount for policymakers to learn from, from tech companies. And I think you both made a very compelling case that the methods that are being used within Uber and Facebook are incredibly sophisticated. Um, and, you know, I think that one of the, the main objectives of BIT is also to build a culture of experimentation within the public sector, it's something we've been very passionate about for a long time. And I think that the type of experimentation you're doing, the sophistication at which you're doing it, um, is a lesson for the public sector in general. Um, I also think some... Can I interrupt one yeah. second? It's just it's a, a small question I have for you on that. It strikes me that a lot of the experimentation that happens on digital platforms, which is made possible by being a digital platform, I'm curious when you mention that, if you think that the whole notion of experimentation is trickling down into non-digital industries. Um, because I think these firms have shown that there's massive value in doing A, B, and A through Z testing mm. that other traditional firms were... Um, hadn't entertained, and now even if it's harder for them to do because they're not digital, if you see that a little bit more? So uh, I, I think that, I hope that that culture is trickling down. I think probably firms that don't have digital platforms have to be a lot more discerning about what they're experimenting on. Uh, they don't have the luxury of being able to run endless A-B tests, and so they probably need to be a lot more hypothesis-driven and a lot more... Uh, I guess, pickier about what they're testing and why, and what they want to learn. Mm. Okay. Uh, but I interrupted you then, and you wanted to lob I one more I think actually I'll... Yeah. No, it's all right. I'll, okay. I'll right. move on. Yeah. <laughs> well, so creating fires uh, and <laughs> the such. Uh, um, I mean, I think that anyone who has paid attention to the media over, the let's say, the last two years uh, probably will have their favorite thing that they think... Facebook as a company is not doing well. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and we do definitely take that criticism seriously. And we're actually looking uh, for ways for, for policymakers and regulators uh, to, uh, to set some ground rules that can help us. I mean, I think uh, if you've also read the media, you've also heard, for example, our, our leadership calling for uh, for the help to establish reg regulation. Now, one of the reasons why we call for, uh, for actual regulation is that we're in a very difficult situation as a global company, that what will fly in the U.S. Uh, and the concerns that get raised by users in the U.S. are not consistent with the concerns that get raised by users in Germany, Can for example. Can you give a quick specific example, please? Yes. So... Uh, Definitions of, of hate speech mm -hmm. and, um, and how, uh, the, uh, uh, how regulating content uh, interacts with norms around free speech, right? We don't want to be the ones that are actually in the middle trying to negotiate these things. And so that's one of the reasons why we're looking for ways to give more um, external voice. And, and we're doing that both with our uh, requests for and, and our, our vocalizations about help us set, set some regulation so that we have some predictability and some targets to go towards, uh, where there's uh, more voices than just the people who are sitting in Menlo Park thinking about these things. Yeah. Um, and, but we've also tr uh, have uh, worked to initiate like uh, um, independent oversight boards around like content regulation and things like that. And ultimately, I think that is the direction that we need to go. The people who sit in Menlo Park working on these products day by day are well-meaning people. They, they, uh, we actually have very few conversations around uh, you know, our profits or revenues. Um, I would say that 
within a given year, I'm, even though I'm in tons of product reviews, very, very few of them is one of the outcome goals. What does it do to, uh, to our bottom line? Um, we're, Mark is, is mission-driven. The company is mission-driven. Uh, and what we want to do is really connect people, et cetera, et cetera, and that uh, we will focus on things like revenue much later, and we haven't had to worry about it yet, right. and we ha so we don't do that. But the people in Menlo Park are, are a, a unique subset of people who live in the San Francisco Bay Area, et cetera. They have uh, their views of the world that are not consistent with necessarily everyone else's views of the world, uh, let's say in Topeka, Kansas, or in, uh, here in London or, or elsewhere. And so for a truly global network that is supposed to uh, give people a, a voice and democratize the sense that people can express themselves and have their, uh, their values expressed through it, we need help for that. And I mean, I mean no offense by this, maybe a tiny bit of offense, but um, <laughs> it is, your position is wonderful to not worry about that, but it is kind of a luxury good when you're with a firm that's got a market cap like that. I mean, yes, let's just be honest. It is. You know, if you're a dairy and, you're, and your profit margin is 2.5%, you know, it's a different, it's a different, it's great that you've got the latitude and it's, it is, I think, a positive mark for the company that Mark and others want to have that kind of mission as, yeah. as exhibited by you. I just want to acknowledge it for a lot of firms and for a lot of institutions and certainly governments, it's a, it's a different issue. Moshe, I'm curious if you have a... Sure. Uh, so let me start by saying Facebook definitely understands long-term. That story was meant to be facetious. <laughs> they get it. Um, so I'll say I'm more speaking on my own behalf, not Uber. I'm not on Uber's policy team. Uh, so I'll make two quick points. I think one thing that we kind of really want from regulators... I don't know how tied to tech it is, but more just transportation in general is, there can be a lot of ambiguity and a lot of things like selective enforcement or arbitrariness in transportation regulations. And I think we want a lot more clarity from the countries we operate in, the cities we operate in. We want to be good partners with the city governments. Uh, we want to help overall transportation in the city, but that can be hard when there's a lot of regulatory ambiguity. In terms of what Uber can do better, um, I don't know if this is even so specific to Uber, but just kind of tech in general. Machine learning is kind of like a hot buzzword now, but it can be very, it can lead you to dangerous outcomes. So um, Curtis mentioned that you should really experiment with some theory behind what you're doing to really understand the mechanisms, to try to understand what's going on. And machine learning is often a crutch for not doing that. It's like, well, this predicts well, mm. so just let it loose and let's see what happens. And even, uh, as, as Curtis said, the best-intentioned people who have no desire to create any sort of disparate impacts across different groups, if you let these models loose without very careful safeguards, it will happen. And that's something we do care about at Uber, trying to rein these models in, make sure we understand what's going on, and make sure that we're not discriminating. But it can be hard when you don't understand kind of the inner workings of these very complicated empirical models. Excellent. Um, okay, I'd like to take some um, audience questions. Who is GJ? Okay, so congrat can we applaud? Because top voted question, first of all, <laughs> with, um, with an astonishing 36 upvotes. Okay, so that's, that's pretty great for this. Um, and it's a question you guys, yeah, okay, you're seeing it there. So um, I love this question. I think that we could spend an hour defining terms here. Should the data generated by platforms um, be considered a public good? We could talk about what a public good is. Completely accessible by governments and nonprofits. Completely? Complete? Okay. I'd love to talk about how complete you really mean. <laughs> Pursuing the public good. And what then is, you know, the public good versus a public good and so on. But I think it's a great question. Um, it makes me think of firms, uh, your firms both... You know, I think of your firm with um, transportation. I mean, if I'm a civic planner, if I'm a mayor, I really, really, really love your data. If I'm any kind of building social trust, I love your data and yep. so on. But then I also think about firms like 23andMe, which is a really interesting business model, really, where people are paying to give their data that then 23andMe is using to monetize um, by coming up with pharmaceutical products, which is, we would argue, a wonderful thing, but also a, an interesting chain of, I wouldn't call it exploitation, but a change of interflow. 
So and then, and then I'm guessing your perspective is, I'm guessing you're on the side of complete accessibility and so on. But I'd love for each of you to take a quick crack at that question, please. I, I can start. Uh, I speak for myself, not Uber, but my answer is no. Uh, I mean, Uber operates in a super competitive environment. It's a, it's a business, right? Buried in our data are a ton of kind of like facts that you can uncover that tell you a lot about the competitive environment, how the business works, business insights. So no, I don't think that for free should kind of be given to the public and to our competitors. Now, cut, cut off a piece of your data. For instance, there have been a lot of interesting um, papers by economists about the gender pay gap, about consumer surplus, et cetera, et cetera. So wall off the data that you would absolutely disallow and then tell us what might be left. So I think, like you mentioned, working with cities to better improve traffic flow, better improve how public transport is set up, kind of the private-public partnership of Uber plus public transportation, I think that's an area that we definitely want to share more in and work more closely with cities on. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Um, I, I, I think that we're actually looking for ways to uh, more easily share data right now. Um, so as far as, like, everything and completely accessible. <laughs> Again, I don't speak for Facebook, but I think that would be um, probably a step too far. But the truth is that large platforms such as Facebook, we, we have uh, tremendous advantages that smaller companies, policymakers, researchers, uh, et cetera, don't have access to. Um, that, frankly, if we had more people working on the data, it would probably also help us. So there's a, a bit of self-interest in there as well. Um, the problem that we have is that we don't currently have a framework within the policy discussion mm -hmm. with governments and privacy advo advocacy groups, et cetera, for, or the technology right now to effectively share data in a privacy-preserving way that everyone feels comfortable wow. with. Wow. Why does that not exist? I'm because it's incredibly hard. Really? It, I mean, I'm a civilian. Tell me why. I mean, is the, you're, you're talking about the actual... Uh, uh, architecture of the sharing is, is the difficult part or getting to the policy of what to allow and what not? Getting to the policy is really hard right. and that those discussions have been happening but they haven't necessarily been moving forward a, in ways uh, that are suggestive yeah. that a solution is on the horizon. Okay. But we actually need, this is one of those places where having regulatory help would, uh, okay. would work. All right, so let's do a little role play. Let's, uh, and again, you don't speak. I don't speak uh, no, for no, no, I recognize that, and, and we yeah. won't hold you to it, but let's imagine we've got two people here. Um, you, you both know your interests. Um, let's say that, um, let's say, you know, one of David Halpern's great passions for many years has been social trust. Mm -hmm. As it's an incredibly valuable lubricant. It's kind of mysterious. We, yeah. we think we know what produces it, but maybe not. Um, let's say that, you know, you come and say Facebook, you know, nearly 3 billion people, massively valuable resource in that direction. Mm -hmm. We need your data. You want us to have your data. It will make you guys look great. It will probably also help your, your firm long term. So let's start to have a con Tell me exactly why that mechanism is difficult to arrive at. By, by having the conversation. So it's just the two of you. We're not here. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> sure. Okay. Well, I guess what we, the type of data that we'd want to access it is not um, personally identifiable data in that situation. We'd be interested in things Seemingly like... personally identifiable. Uh -oh. No. Seemingly not. Example, please. Uh, well, go so, ahead and talk so about what example, data you want and we'll have an example. You, you have people's location data, uh, which cities they live in, where they're moving around when they're on the app. It would be interesting to see, actually, do people talk and interact with people just in their geographic area? And if they don't, how do, how do those geographic ties work? What, what are, what's people's general radius of interaction? And uh, at what level of abstraction would you want that information? Well, definitely not at the individual level. I think probably at the city level. So uh, for somebody living in a particular neighborhood in a city, um, are they, what percentage of their interactions happen within that neighborhood? Yeah, I think when we're starting to talk about individual neighborhoods and we're talking about interactions, 
it only takes a few interactions to be able to identify someone. Right. Let's if, do it if at you're the city doing level it, then. Uh, okay. So then uh, once you start abstracting it to the city level or to the state level, those sorts mm -hmm. of things might become easier. But at the same time, the underlying data there, uh, we, we do have issues with uh, if you're able to pull things out, um, that it doesn't actually take a number how, of interactions. How would we be able to pull things out? Well, I'm also not uh, our data privacy officer. So, uh, <laughs> but what what I know is that uh, is that those those discussions are that it actually in in situations, uh, and it might not be the majority of situations, but and, and it might be more similar to edge cases. That if you're looking, for example, at geographic data, if you're looking at interactions between different geographies that it, it doesn't take much information to be able to triangulate who or narrow it down to, to subsets of people. Because that, that's actually come up before. We also have issues of things like uh, migratory patterns where there are potential groups that could be at risk if we made this data available mm -hmm. where their migratory patterns, uh, you know, they don't, they're not necessarily loved by everyone. Mm. Um, and we wouldn't want that data to fall into the hands, even at an aggregate level, in, in ways that would make it uh, um, risky. The, the other thing that we have to remember is that people don't go to Facebook to necessarily participate in these uh, public good type forums. And so there needs to be some perspective on the policy side uh, that, this, that this is a public good and that this is something that, uh, that we need to figure out how to get the appropriate consent from people after the fact, after they have given this information, their ability to opt out of providing that information and everything else. And, and it's not just us focusing on these tech issues on how to be able to provide the data. Um, like the US federal government is investing a lot in differential privacy. And uh, Facebook is, is looking at these things and everything else. These, these aren't even solved solutions between government agencies in the US. So to expect that we would already have them is, is kind of difficult. So but we want to work with, with agencies to do it. So I think it's an interesting question what people consent to because we, you know, we've already established nobody in this room ha has read the terms and conditions or, uh, or privacy notice for Facebook even though everybody is on it. Um, so you're already conducting experiments, um, many of which are really fascinating. So looking at emotional contagion, whether where people are interacting with people in a particular tenor, does that make them feel happy as well or does that mm -hmm. make them feel depressed as well? What makes you think that people are comfortable being part of that type of experiment, um, which is being used within Facebook to optimise the news feed? but they're not comfortable being part of an experiment or data collection that could help to achieve broader public policy goals? That's a good question. <laughs> Let, let's be clear, you brought up emotional contagion, which happened in 2014. Mm -hmm. And I think what we learned at that point is that we have to be a lot more careful with uh, even experimentation that uh, that might be beneficial for product development, and so we have uh, we have taken steps to make sure that uh, that we have better internal rules around those things. But we also but need to think about about environments that are not just environments where people feel comfortable with the government. Yeah, um, you can think about. Uh, I, I'm an American and I studied American politics in grad school, so I'm going to use an American example, but there are other examples around the world that you could use as well. Um, one of those examples in the US is actually uh, libertarians thinking about the government getting access to their data, not going to be happy. Um, sure. You could think about people who don't necessarily trust the Duarte government in the Philippines. You can think about people who, uh, who would definitely not want anything about the Rohingya population going to the Myanmar government. Mm. Like, it, it, these are things that all have to be worked out together, and we're interested in working those out together, but what we're saying is we don't have all the answers now. We're not opposed to it. We mm. need help, 
And that's what we're asking when we ask for these conversations and for these regulatory environments. We would love the knowledge to be shared. We would love the data to, to uh, be a public good that can help society. I, to oh, sorry. I, I totally agree. Yeah, I think that deserves an applause as well. Um, I totally agree, and, and to be clear, I, I don't think that this is a fair or uh, appropriate thing for Facebook to decide on its own. And I think it's really important to, to have a, a more sophisticated understanding of actually what are the preferences uh, of your users yes. and what do they want their data to be used for and what are they not comfortable with. Yeah. And I think it, you know, it's really interesting to think about the types of mechanisms you could use to, to, you know, to use privacy notices not just as a tick box, but actually a genuine mechanism to, to understand the collective preferences of your users. I absolutely agree with that. And one of the things that my team help does in a lot of those sorts of experimentation things at Facebook is not just rely things to revealed preferences, not just rely if somebody uh, mm. clicks that box and moves on, that, that we assume that they have... Uh, that they have expressed to us what they actually want. That there is a place, even, with, even though this is called behavioral exchange, that there is a place for stated preferences. There is a place for, for actually talking to the users yeah. even when they are parts of these experiments to make sure that unintended consequences are not happening. Mm. Excellent. Um, we have just a few minutes remaining. I'd like to ask um, each of you to answer a similar, uh, a similar question. Maybe we'll customize it a little bit. Moshe, we'll start with you. Um, so one thing that I think is remarkable about the Behavioral Insights team and this environment, this ecosystem that's been created, is that it's provided kind of a framework similar to what you've been talking about, which is um, let's use um, empirical research to make policy. Like, yeah. why that had not been the default option in the past is hard to say, but it's remarkable. So I think we'd all agree that there are inroads, many, many of them positive, and, there's, and the world is complicated and, and things are happening often in good directions. I, I want to say that you two... I feel that you've become pinatas a little bit. Um, all right. And I'm sure you're used to it, but it's, but it's not quite fair because we shouldn't um, forget about the massive consumer surplus. And so I really appreciate this back and forth. Here's what I propose for each of you. Um, let's pretend that each of you, uh, in your current position, you take a leave um, for a year uh, uh, to be an advisor to, uh, let's say, a Democratic presidential candidate. Uh, candidate, the, 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 the eventual Democratic uh, nominee, okay? And, and, and your advice will be along the lines of your experience for all three of you. And I want you to, in just like a minute, let, let's pretend I'm the candidate, and, and just in one or two minutes, I want you to tell me, based on what you've seen from your firm, what you've come to understand about the economy slash society, et cetera, that you think is really important for me to know to communicate. Because Uber is a remarkably large and robust labor platform. You know, we've, we talk about the consumer end. It's a, it's a huge labor platform, et cetera, et cetera. So you tell me, first of all, in 60 to 120 seconds, something that's really important for me to convey to the citizenry that you've learned that you wouldn't have had you not been doing what you've been doing for the past few years. Sure. So again, I speak for myself, not for Uber. I think the one thing that's often missing from the policy debate around Uber, um, especially given some of the super loud voices in the room when these discussions come up, is the value of flexibility in labor. The economy is changing. Um, and there are a lot of people, a lot of people, who either because of skills or because of assets or just because of the overall labor market structure have a hard time breaking into work. Uh, they could be looking for part-time jobs that are flexible around their schedules with their kids. They could be looking for a side job to earn money. And often in the U.S., I think in Europe as well, the labor market discussion can be super focused on traditional nine-to-five jobs. A lot of people aren't looking for that. A lot of people really do value flexibility. When we poll drivers, when we talk to drivers in focus groups, the number one thing that they like about Uber is the flexibility, that they can drive whenever they want, um, that they can set their own schedule, that they can basically be their own boss. But in kind of the policy discussion, this is completely missing, that value of flexibility. So that's the thing that I want kind of the Democrats and the Republicans to think more about. Like, how do we think about a flexible labor market where people can use their skills and start making money immediately, kind of removing 
frictions and barriers to entry to working? It's a great answer. Um, I do know from the Uber gender pay gap paper, we learned that female Uber drivers who do earn a little bit less for a variety of interesting reasons, that the, the highest single period uh, of earnings for female drivers is Sunday afternoons when all the men are watching American football. <laughs> and so it's a great opportunity. So once you know that, it's actually a really nice arbitrage opportunity. So I think that's a great point. Okay, Curtis, uh-huh. you have this m- unbelievably successful um, um, firm that has learned a great deal about really human nature and social cohesion and some other things yeah. too. So tell me something that we need to communicate that's not known. Well, I I don't think it's unknown, but I think it's often forgotten. And that is that that Facebook and platforms like it really are a microcosm for the world in that the issues that the world is facing and has been facing for a long time, uh, not just since the advent of Facebook and those types of uh, platforms, Uh, manifest themselves on those platforms because it is a social system. Um, And so while there's a lot of good that happens on those platforms, some of it because of like our uh, our ability to allow small businesses uh, to advertise and reach customers where they otherwise wouldn't, Uh, it gives people a voice that they otherwise wouldn't, it allows people to find uh, groups and connect to people that are uh, like-minded with them in ways that uh, provides them a sense of community. All those things are great. But the social problems that exist in the world are not Facebook social problems. They are the world's social problems that are playing out uh, on Facebook in a more visible way than they have in the past. And so what was not transparent before is now transparent. And this gives us an opportunity to both understand it better and to figure out how to solve those social ills. But we're not going to solve those social ills by... uh, by essentially laying blame at the feet of only one group. Yeah. We need to work together on it. We need the partnerships. We need the help of policymakers yeah. and those things. But they're not just our problems. Yeah, that's a, I think that's a great point. Thank you. Uh, Liz, so you're coming from, you know, friend of, uh, uh, you know, friend of the government a little bit. Um, <laughs> yes. Not entirely because, you know, you interact in a different way. And, um, and let's say I say to you, well, I, I understand you've been working kind of both sides. You've learned a lot about, um, you, you consider yourself a defender of the user, the consumer in many ways, and you feel like you're kind of cleaning up the mess of firms that are um, profit-seeking firms, whether in fintech or whatnot. Um, but you also understand that business is, you know, the lubricant that makes society work, um, and it's really important. Yeah. So give me something that might, might be a little surprised to hear someone from the, the, the pro-government side say. <laughs> So there's, that, that we've already seen, as you've said, huge consumer surplus flowing from online markets and online platforms. And I think we've really only begun to scratch the surface. You know, the examples I showed today um, of our experiments with an online job board show that there's potential to make labor markets work better. There's potential to make democracies work better. You know, we, together we can achieve great things through the networks that we've built online. But we need a new regulatory framework to be able to do that. So classically, we've thought about um, consumers and markets in silos. You know, you're a UK energy consumer and you're regulated by, you know, if you're an energy supplier, you're regulated by the UK energy regulator. And that just doesn't work in online markets. They cross geographies, they cross sectors. Um, You know, if you're on Facebook, who, which regulator should care about that? And the answer can't be all of them and none of them. So we need a new approach to do that. We need to work together to look at actually where is the evidence of where the fires are and what, what can we do about them. Excellent. I would like to thank our panel organizer, Chris Wright, for putting this together. I would love to thank... Uh, our panelists, who I thought were excellent, Moshe, Curtis, and Liz, and especially to you for, for listening to us. Thank you all very much. You're welcome. Thank you.